it was one of the best weekends and no one could get in and out of the marina because it took that long to clean it up and that was a spill from one boat. Marinas are, if you like, gatekeepers to the oceans and waterways but without the boat owners helping to protect those oceans and waterways then it's not going to work. It's not the case that all boat owners are wealthy so we do need to find solutions that are workable for everybody. Hello and welcome to This Marina Life with me, Kerry Herford-Jones and MDL Marinas. This show is all about the central role MDL are taking to protect the aquatic environment and how those of us that enjoy our time out on the water can really help to make a difference. In this episode, we're going to have a close examination of the problems caused by hazardous oil spills and fuel in the water. Because, to be fair, it's an area that really needs addressing for many reasons, of course, including being just more aware of the environment that we inhabit and our impact on it. Follow the story at hashtag Green Marinas or search MDL Marinas today. In this episode, you'll hear from Kerry Marriott, who looks after the operational side of MDL's business that encompasses all of their marinas, boatyards, dry stacks and holiday parks. I also managed to catch up with Jonathan White, the general manager for the Yacht Harbour Association. They act as a specialist association for British Marine. The group represents somewhere in the region of 500 marinas in the UK with the aim of trying to reach a common goal as representatives for the marine industry both here and abroad. And finally, we'll hear from Phil Horton from the RYA's Green Blue Initiative, who has some really relevant practical tips for boat owners when handling fuel and oils near the water. The RYA now represents around 100,000 individual members, as well as 1,400 clubs around the UK, along with 2,500 training centres around the world. First up, let's hear from Kerry about how big a problem she thinks oil and fuel spillages actually are in the marina sector. Any oil spill or diesel or any other fuel spill, whether that's the small drops or obviously large amounts, is of real concern. Oil spills pollute our seas and rivers, and if we soak through to the soil and rock, can then go on to, to pollute groundwater, and then obviously habitats of fish and other wildlife around our coasts and riverbanks. We see that a lot on the news, but I think it, it's worth pointing out that even the smallest drop adds up. So uh, as a business, we do not use any uh, sort of dispersants because uh, we're still in, sort of researching that at the moment. Back in the day, many years ago, you'd see someone with a little bit of oil, a few little teaspoons, which you know spreads on the seabed, and they would squirt in their washing up liquid or fairy liquid, um, and it would disperse, but that's also no longer a viable option for any of us. So we're constantly researching better ways of dealing with these issues. But I think it is fair to say that the small amounts all add up, same as it with anything. It always looks like it as a boat owner, when you're looking in the water and you see this sort of slick go past you, diesel slick go past you, it looks like a lot. But I mean, that could just be a tablespoonful, couldn't it? It could be, and then sometimes it's not, and I think that's the concern. So a tablespoon will spread a lot, and we're actually currently looking at the robotic machinery that can skimmers, for want of a better word, that will go around and eat that surface fuel up. You often get it from a tiny amount will look like it's spread. At the same time, you don't know that that's a tiny amount. It could be huge. We've had some recent issues at some of our sites that have caused some quite costly cleanup processes the recent one at Chatham Marina cost over eight thousand pounds and we never really found out where it came from so obviously someone's boat there was an oil leak it didn't seem to be that bad at first but it did it spread and again that's an average price it could be a lot more and essentially that can be passed back to the boat owner if we know who they are they are liable for those fees within our marina regulation so it's very costly, but it also then directly impacts others because it drives up the cost of boating overall. So for us to deliver that bathing package, all of these things come into that. So it's worthwhile from morals and environmental concerns aside, just from a financial point of view, as far as bathing is concerned, it, you know, it, it really is quite a concern for us. 
and let's face it, this is all about the environmental impact as well, isn't it? And sea life absolutely really dramatically can be affected by hazardous waste going into the water. Yes, that that's very true, and that is you know not just for oils. Our marine regulations are built around our environmental. Um, awareness and concerns and it's all about trying to educate our customers because i don't think people directly do it and think you know i just don't care i'm sure they don't but it's those odd spills that people think well actually if you'd taken a bit more care or if you'd made sure your boat was completely seaworthy and just taken some a bit more time and trouble with their own responsibilities and so we're working very hard with our marketing teams to constantly update our customers on new initiatives and just to keep raising that awareness because as you say any small amount can directly impact you i know there's a recent podcast that you kindly hosted on plastics and you know in in our seas and we know that that gets inside fishes that we're eating that's no different to some of these oil spills it has a detrimental effect all, all around and potentially killing wildlife as well let's talk about some of the practical things then that as, as us as boat owners can do to help here because it, you've mentioned there are a few things that we ought to be aware of in terms of actually what we can do, it's simple things, isn't it? It's like not overfilling your fuel tank. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one, but it's very easy not to or to do, if you like, because when you're doing it and you're decanting it into the tank, sometimes it, it, it is a bit difficult to tell when you're actually reaching the top. So what you're saying, I think, is don't overfill it, just t- top off the tank, but don't try and cram too much in. Yes, absolutely. And also be aware that our regulation states that all of our berth holders can only refuel on either a designated fuel berth or a designated fuel refilling area. So we're asking our berth holders to not top up, you know, their tanks and think in anywhere that's not designed for that purpose. Now, part of that will be because we have all of our spill kits ready, our staff are highly trained to deal with in all sort of spill responses, both on and off the water, because obviously this isn't just going into the water course. Sometimes it goes directly into land ashore because you might have some spillages from a boat that is ashore in our boatyards. See, that still gets through through the ground and into the habitat of, you know, and whether that's the plant life or whether it's other creatures ashore, that, that does affect the environment. So all of our MGR staff are fully trained in the oil spill response as I said and they will know where all of the spill kits kept so we've got lots of equipment ready to deal with with these concerns so we would ask our bath holders to make sure they are refueling in the correct places because then if they do have an accident we are geared up ready to go and literally resolve the issue as it happens. And as you say, you know, long, long time ago, it was, oh, yeah, squirt a bit of fairy liquid around it or or something. Now you're using a specialist kit that actually doesn't really do anything apart from just soak up the diesel and the oil. Is that right? That's right. And that in itself then becomes hazardous waste, which is then responsibly disposed of through our hazardous waste receptacles. And we have contracts in place across all of our sites. We have, you know, again, same with with breath holders. If, If they were to clean up their own, diesel spill with a few oily rags can you please make sure they're placed in the right receptacles in the hazardous waste disposal areas they're at every single one of our sites and then they will be responsibly and effectively disposed of in the right way that is going to protect our environments we could give all sorts of examples but there's a couple of obvious ones there including things i suppose like having a filter in your bilge and making sure that when you're pumping out your oil again that you're collecting it safely and disposing of it well and and let's make the point and i think it's worth making that mdl as you've mentioned a couple of times you do have all the facilities on site to collect all these hazardous wastes don't you Yes, we do. So we have them. So some sites have slightly more facilities than others, but there will always be a local marina that can take that. If not, we can help make arrangements to take anything away. But we do have those facilities available, as I say, across the whole of our network and certainly around all the boatyards. If you look, there's very, very good signage and it's and it tells you everything is, is signposted. Everything's labelled. So it's it's made as simply as we can for you. And obviously there's no additional cost to the birth holder for that facility. So it's there. So please make good use of it and, and you know, make sure that you're taking your own environmental responsibilities, you know, making sure that you're, you're abiding to all the moral sides and your own commitments.
I think what you're saying there is it doesn't take too much effort to actually not only comply, as you quite rightly say, with the bylaws or the requirements of your licensing, but equally so morally. Why would you not take a bit more care and a bit more attention? Yeah, I think as a business, our aim is to be the UK's most green and sustainable marine operator. And we're very keen to develop a culture of environmental awareness and and care amongst our customers and our team. So that's our breath holders, that's our tenants, that's all marina users, whether they're just a day visitor, but that's also amongst our staff and amongst ourselves. And hopefully through that ongoing education and, you know, podcasts such as this can give people ideas and pointers of of where to go if they need more information because it's all out there and quite often it's simple tips and it's just remembering things we do, we don't allow the discharge of any bilge contents within the marina basin so it's things like that you know that directly impacts on us and that is something that's quite um unfortunately a little bit more common than we'd like so again that's something that it is something basic that uh, a bus holder can do and can instantly help us and the environment You've mentioned there the staffing. Let's talk a little bit there about the staff because there's a there's a fair amount of training involved here to to actually be not only compliant but to understand from their perspective there's the risks involved in dealing with hazardous stuff, uh, but equally so doing the job well. There must be a huge amount of training that your team must go through. Really, from day one, all of our teams, literally on the day they start with us, will be made aware of all of our health and safety environmental policies and processes that go with that they'll understand what our aims are as a business and where we're heading and then you get down to nitty-gritty the training so you can have fuel delivery courses the receipt of petrol because that obviously impacts straight away on the environment if you were to have that would be quite a major spill we do a lot of training with other emergency services so sometimes that is oil response people sometimes that is the fire brigade etc but we actually do live scenarios and we carry out training with our team so it's live training because i think sometimes you Lots of training is great, but when it actually comes to it on the day and the adrenaline kicks in, you go, what do I do now? And, and we have had some major mock-ups with oil spills. And actually, I've been involved myself before, and you wouldn't necessarily always think what you think is the right thing to do isn't always the case. And it was quite an eye-opener, really. So, yeah, and we annually review all of that training and inspect and try to have at least one made incident activity if you like every single year if we can as long as we can get the other services involved in that so so that it's live and ongoing and it, and it's a constant review these problems can escalate and become bigger and bigger and bigger from what can be what appears to be dare i say on the surface actually a really deep deep problem yes absolutely and as a business we obviously look at these sort of scenarios and worst case scenarios we do a lot of continuity planning so what would happen if all of those things and and interestingly going back to the incident at Chatham there was a fuel spill and it was larger than our team could deal with as a level one response to that situation so we had to get the experts in and they literally closed the marina it's, it's a locked basin so the only way to secure that and not pollute the whole of the river medway was to close the marina so the indirect impact that that then had for others you know, it's not just the clean up, it's not just the cost. They then had three days where no one could go out and it just so happened because it's the way it always goes. It was a beautiful sunny day with one of the best weekends and no one could get in and out of the marina because it took that long to clean it up. And that was a spill from one boat, but we could never categorically trace it back to where it came from, frustratingly. Let's hope somebody hears this will make them think next time because as boat owners, we are responsible for our own boats, but being responsible and, and thinking about the bigger picture, as you quite rightly said, one small incident can cause a major, major problem. This is going to be an ongoing issue in terms of education and enlightenment about all of this. How will you know that all this work you're doing, all this publicity, all this awareness, how will you know that you've actually got the message out there? I'm not sure you'll ever be able to get to the point where we've done enough because I don't think we will. I think that's just it's going to be a continual development of our education and and publicising by, by these different means. But I think when we see a reduction in in these incidents uh, you know around the marinas because we're very very keen as a business to work with our staff and we we do a lot of education of them so that they are working correctly and just to the point where i said 
fairy liquor is no longer there and we're looking for green alternatives and something we might be able to help and we're certainly working with a different environment agencies to to actually look at these different things and different items of kit that we can use but i think i think when we'll see the success is when we aren't having these big spills or they become very very rare which unfortunately is not the case at the moment i also managed to catch up with jonathan white the general manager for the yacht harbour association they act as a specialist association for British Marine. The group represents somewhere in the region of 500 marinas in the UK with the aim of trying to reach a common goal as representatives for the marine industry both here and abroad. We launched in the UK last September at Southampton International Boat Show. However, the program has been running for uh, many more years than that through our partner organisation in Australia, the Marina Industries Association. So TIHA and MIA, the abbreviations, work closely together on the Clean Marina Programme. Why did they lead? How did they end up in the vanguard of it? Well, very good question. They started more through a require for help on compliance, actually. That's how Clean Marina started in Australia. We adopted it, uh, as I say, fairly recently, but rather than actually on the compliance side of things, it's very much so. Taihar's Clean Marina program is very much about sharing best practice amongst our members and encouraging everyone to get the basics right and gradually raise their standards. And how much resource is British Marine putting into something like this? Well, it's actually it's Taihar rather than British Marine putting the resource into it. A combination of Taihar and MIAs, we put our staff resource into it, and likewise we have a team of assessors who support marinas in their assessment process, but also providing expert advice as well. And you said right at the beginning there, it's about best practices, about learning. It must be quite challenging though when there is an oil spill, when there there are these hazardous matters out there. Frustrating to actually get traction and get things moving in the right direction. This isn't a quick fix, is it? No, no, it's not. A, it's not a quick fix. We work very closely with our members on getting the basics right. We very much recognised when we kicked this program off through our membership that actually we have to start, if you like, from the ground up. If that makes sense, it, this isn't about all of the really nice additional things to do. This is to do with actually ensuring that marinas have all the facilities required to protect the water courses that they operate in. So, you know, that's to do with, it's to do with black water pump out, it's to do with segregated and hazardous waste, it's to do with spill prevention and treatment, wash down capture and filtration, drain interception, and, and of course, influencing their boating customers. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute because that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the nub of the question is how are they doing? But let's come on to that in a moment. This is quite interesting from the perspective of where you have marinas who are clearly setting goals here, setting out their stall and doing very well at it. And I'm, I'm not asking you to name names and those that perhaps a little bit later to the party. But you must have some really good examples out there now of people who are really doing this very well, do you? Oh, indeed, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some, um, many of our members are, are, are doing doing a good job. Mind you, it's amazing when you actually go around and have a look. There's, there's always ways we can help them. There's always ideas we can put in place. I, I was, only last week, I was very fortunate to be in a, in a lovely marina in, uh, in Holland, actually, and uh, looking at their operations there. And uh, they, they were just so natural in the way that they looked after the environment and, and their every thought process they had about managing their marina included a thought process about keeping the water the, the, the waters clean as well so really really very impressive yeah and bringing those lessons home now and sharing them with other people obviously absolutely. at the heart of, heart of what you do john in, in your spare time obviously uh, of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> So it's good to hear. It's good to hear that there are people out there, there are plenty of marinas out there already showing that this can be done. This can be at the very heart, as you quite rightly said, very much at the heart of the operation, not as an add-on. This isn't something as an optional extra. This is something we've really all got to take some responsibility for, haven't we? 
Uh, absolutely, yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, and the all, I know, I know we're going to go on to talk about about boat owners, but uh, y- y- you know, it's everyone working together on this. That there's, it cannot work through the business. The business can invest and have a hundred percent focus on looking after the environment, but the reality is, unless boat owners actually join the join the quest then that's you know the outcome isn't going to be as we would all want so it's everyone working together yeah yeah quite right so let's let's grasp that particular nettle then about boat owners god bless them and what we can do what more could we do do you think john everyone has to play their part in this so firstly it's to recognize that that you know if a boat owner keeps their boat in a marina then they should actually take part in looking after the water that is their playground to be perfectly honest you know you know marinas are if you like gatekeepers to the oceans and waterways but without the boat owners helping to protect those oceans and waterways then that's not all it's not going to work i think one of the first things to, that boat owners can do is to read the communications that marinas provide for them that might be through their website it might be through signage likewise to talk to marine staff about what they can do to best protect the environment. Mm. Also to look at their boat and look at the facilities they have on their boat and where the interactions, if you like, with the water course could take place and how to prevent that. That may well be to do with the bilge water and uh, depending on the boat, of course, but if you have a bilge pump, particularly an automatic bilge pump, boat owners should seriously consider fitting a a bilge filter. If there's no auto pump on it and it's a simple system, then at least some form of, you know, bilge sock or something just to absorb any oils that happen to sit in the bilge water. And also when you dispose of that bilge water, you can make sure you do that in an environmentally friendly way. So that's not into the marina basin or into the ocean or the canal when you actually get out there. This is kind of difficult with some of the older boats, but not impossible because all, all the stuff is out there. Are they building this kind of technology? Are they building this kind of solution into new boats? Are you seeing that starting to come out, John, in, in the new builds? There's build boats. The Recreational Crafts Directive specifies a, a much higher level of environmental compliance these days. You know, it specifies the, the fitting of holding tanks for black water and the likes, whereas older boats don't necessarily have that. So yes, yeah, standards are definitely improving um, the in- environmental uh, credentials of, of new boats. But likewise, whatever boat you have, there is a solution to looking after the environment better. And it's a matter of boat owners engaging with relevant experts. And that might be the marina operator. It might be you know engineers that, uh, that look after their boats. But the information is out there. It's just a matter of looking for it. What about then other areas? We've talked about, about bilge oil, that's, that's an important one. Anything else? Things like black water pump out is, um, is something we should all take very seriously. Now, on the inland waterways, and we have many members on the canal networks and rivers, it's, it's much more natural to use black water pump out because it's much more obvious if you'd like <laughs> if yeah. you don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you know you're polluting because it's, it's exactly. an obvious screen behind yes and so does everyone else yeah <laughs> you know whereas obviously if you cruise on the coast you can go offshore i mean you can you can legally go three miles offshore and and dump your your black water tanks but what why would we do that why would we put effluent into our beautiful oceans when actually most marinas will either themselves provide a blackwater pump out facility or there will be one nearby so again it's a matter of boat owners as long as they have holding tanks of course looking for those facilities and if they don't have holding tanks then of course consider fitting them if that's possible and also and if it's not possible then consider your usage of your heads you know carefully Mm. yeah and look, you know, marinas are being quite innovative. I know of a very good example in Portsmouth, which I'm sure you know of as well, where they actually have got a barge that moves around the marina, emptying people's black water tanks. And I think that's quite an innovative solution, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know the marina well, and uh, they've got a great approach to it, a very proactive approach. Some marinas have, have barges, as you say, or boats with uh, pump-out facilities on them. And, uh, you know, others have portable carts that go around and pump boats out. And, uh, and of course, many will have a fixed pump-out station. The boat owners also should challenge marinas. So if a marina doesn't have a black water pump out, the, the, the boat owners should be challenging marinas to fit them. And if the pump out system isn't working, then boat owners should challenge the marinas to get them fixed. And uh, something we do through Clean Marina is uh, we, we look at how these systems, these black water pump out systems are maintained and ensure that if they fail for any reason, that there is a solution to fix them very rapidly because these are vital pieces of equipment. So look, black water tanks, some oil, obviously we can talk about diesel till the cows come home. The boat owners, when they're refuelling, can clearly play their part. Marinas will normally provide uh, facilities to protect the environment, which might be these sort of donut style socks that go around the, the nozzle to prevent blowback. Also, a boat owner will get to know their boat quite well and know whether it's likely to blow back, know whether there's going to be any leakage out of the breather. If others are filling your boat, advise them as to how they should do it in an environmentally friendly way. Use absorbent materials which are provided in marinas to prevent spillage or mop up any spillage. Also, if you do spill into the watercourse, then please don't use detergents to disperse it because all that happens is that just sinks to the bottom and causes environmental harm. You will find pads available in most marinas that you can actually put onto the water to absorb that little bit of diesel that might be spilt. Or, of course, speak to the marina staff. Admit that there's been a spillage. No one's going to point the finger of blame or criticise you. Be honest. And if there's a spillage, tell the marina and they'll help, they'll help you clear that up. Yeah, really, really good points there, John. I think there's there's some very, very simple and very effective measures that can be taken by boat owners. And, and as you said right at the beginning, it's about shared responsibility. And I think that's actually the two key words from today's podcast. Get that completely. Let's ask that question then about what could oil and fuel suppliers themselves do more to reduce the risk of pollution? Well, that's that's an interesting one. Uh, uh, themselves, they are getting better and better. You know, they they have trade associations that work with them, and, and of course, they run the risk of being fined. They're in the spotlight in terms of their operations. So, I would say that marinas work closely with their fuel suppliers, and they will ensure that obviously not only is the fuel supplier providing a high quality fuel and the correct fuel but that when the, the marina tanks are refilled, that they are done in, in the correct way. Also, in terms of types of fuels, we are actively working with others, including British Marine, on advising our members on using more environmentally friendly fuels when it comes to the cleanliness of the burn of the fuel. You know, users of marinas, if they see any spillage being caused by marina tanks being refilled then they should actually tell the marina that they think that the environment is being damaged again it's it's an honest dialogue that we all need here we often get feedback from our listeners to these podcasts john what would you hope people might do once they've heard today's messaging and they get a sense of what the the thrust of this is all about what would you like people to do in terms of getting more information i think it's a message for everyone really this is not someone else's problem this is a challenge for all of us in looking after our wonderful oceans and waterways and so it's don't actually think it's someone else's problem get in, get involved learn understand what you can do as a boater to look after our wonderful oceans and waterways my final guest is phil horton from the ria's green blue initiative That's been running now since 2005, and I really wanted to know if they've started to see some traction, some results in this area. 
and how big the problems actually are. We are seeing lots of traction, actually, lots of interest in this, both from boaters and from marine businesses. So the Green Blue is run jointly by the RYA and British Marines, so it has input from the end, end boat user and also from industry. And certainly we're seeing an increase in, in interest in this area, sustainability more generally, and also the, the decarbonisation of, of boating, which will actually address some of these questions around fuels and oils, because over the coming years, we'll have a reduced amount of them available to us and, and boats will gradually move away from using those fossil fuels. How big an issue and how much more is there to be done, do you think? Well, I think if you look around the coast, you will see locations where fuels in particular are not handled particularly well. You'll see contaminated land, you'll see run-down buildings in some areas. So I think it, it is a major issue because any of those materials getting into watercourses and into the sea cause substantial damage. A, a tiny amount of oil uh, can spread across a very large area and contaminate significant uh, areas of, of particularly you know, seagrasses and, and other intertidal zones. And you say, and quite rightly, that boat owners are becoming much more aware. But what more could we as boat owners actually do to help protect the environment a bit more in this area? Well, I think it's, there's a behaviour aspect to this. I mean, the advice that we give out through the Green Blue is being aware, as I've already said, that very small amounts of fuel and oil can cause widespread damage. Small boats, wherever possible, we should be refuelling them away from the water. Uh, we need to minimise our fuel handling, so decanting fuels from one container to another is a big risk in itself. And we need to take care to capture all waste oils drips in suitable containers. Uh, and there is uh, technology on hand to help with that. I mean, you should always have a spill kit on hand that can soak up the fuels and oils that you're using using fuel collars when you're filling tanks on water to prevent spillage, breather pipe whistles to tell you when the tank's nearly full. And further on from that, it's about fitting things like bilge filters with strainers where necessary so that you can make sure that when you're pumping out the bilge of the boat, you're not con taking any contamination from your engine into the water. We spoke earlier to Kerry from MDL Marinas, and they are very serious, uh, clearly, about this whole issue. And containments and spill kits all there in the commercial sector, are they readily available for the domestic sector? They definitely are. I mean, you can go to any place like Screwfix. You can buy them very cheaply for a, you know, between 10 and 15 pounds. You can get a reasonable spill kit. That's what I have on my boat. I have a kind of sausage thing that I can put into the bilge if I'm changing the oil on the engine to make sure I capture any of that material. I'm about to fit a bilge filter. You also have just kind of pads that you can put around the filler tubes when you're actually fueling the boat. I do think that some of those things could be made re more readily available at the point of sale because they're very very cheap so compared with the, the value of the fuel that's being put in the boat so it's something that maybe marinas could work on themselves to provide a, a soak up pad when people are, are refueling in particular. Yeah from personal experience you're quite right very few places actually have even just some basic pads to mop up although it's interesting to see just slowly that's starting to change. You've referenced there a good point also about the manufacturers, the suppliers of oils could be providing some of these spill kits, some of these things when you actually top up with fuel. So there's no excuses, I think, is what you're saying. Uh, that's right, because it's a very cheap thing to do. Uh, obviously, they would have their own systems in place for major spills if they did have that. But just providing that, you know, simple mop up pad when someone's handed the fuel hose would be really valuable. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking about, particularly with fitting the, the bilge filter on my boat, is that a previous owner has painted all of the bilges without necessarily preparing it properly. So that is effectively putting a lot of plastics into the bilge water as well. So I'm going to add a strainer to that to make sure that before it gets to the actual bilge filter itself, it can take out all those plastics and I can remove those. So it's just being very aware of effectively not putting anything into the water that isn't water. Do you know what? That's so obvious. So obvious, Phil. Didn't even think of that. You know, again, you're in a mindset, you're thinking, yeah, I'll just get another chandlery, get myself some bilge paint, chuck it on, away we go, I'm doing the right thing for the boat. It's about the manufacturers, the suppliers of hazardous materials and all this kind of stuff. You know, we haven't even talked about anti yet, but actually them, as they seem to be, starting to take some ownership of this. 
That's right. I think as the end boat user, you can do a certain amount. You can really think these things through. But if the products aren't available to you or aren't effective or are way too expensive, then then that that can be a challenge. As you say, we haven't got onto antifouls yet, but that's a classic example where the environmental approach is much more expensive up front, even if it's cheaper over the life of the product. And so we've got to find ways of enabling people to do that because not all boat owners are wealthy. I think that's a real myth, actually. You can go and buy a a reasonable sized boat for a few hundred pounds and you can operate it a lot less than it costs you to run a car. So it's not the case that all boat owners are wealthy. So we do need to find solutions that are workable for everybody. Anything else that boat owners should be aware of in terms of hazardous materials and things that the Green Blue are actually leading on now? Well, I think the other side of it is if you're changing the oil on your boat, for example, is making sure you dispose of all the the waste materials properly. So going to a a marina that has proper hazardous waste disposal facilities. Certainly the marinas I've been into, they're very helpful. They advise on what to do with the waste oil, what to do with the contaminated cleaning products and things that you've used and the gloves and so on that you've used. So it's making sure you do that properly. And the Green Blue has a facilities directory on its website where you can look at a marina and see what environmental services are available. Available. So one of the really key things there is we're encouraging marinas to come to us and tell us what facilities they've got because we can only base our mapping on information that's valid and up to date. Yeah, you don't so know what you don't know. No, no, exactly. We relaunched it around 18 months ago and we essentially went out to all the marinas again and asked for up to date information and we discarded any old information because obviously things change over time. So we're, we're gradually building that up again and that's for coastal and inland services that is that's available. And that's another thing we're hoping to upgrade again soon to make it easier for people to say I want to pump out facility and have a, a drop down list and just show the marinas that have that. It's being driven both by the manufacturers, by the suppliers but also by the people actually running their boats, owning their boats. And we have seen this huge upsurge in boat ownership over the last couple of years. A lot of people very new to boating. So you're quite well placed, aren't you, to get this education really going well? That's right. And that's the main thing that the Green Blue does. It's that outreach to the end boat user to advise them on where to source products and basically best practice in environmental terms. We deliver that through going to events such as the MDL Green Tech Boat Show. We were at Crick Boat Show for the inland sector recently as well. Uh, And our upcoming major event will be the Southampton Boat Show, of course, in in September. So we, we will have a stand at those events. We'll talk to boaters. We'll answer their questions as best we can. We always learn something from that as well. We can't always answer the questions. It means we go away and do some research. And that's the great thing about the Green Blue. Because it's both the RYA and British Marine, we can get that technical input from our side, but also from the industry side as well my counterpart in British Marine is their technical specialist so we do share information and we come up with common positions we don't always agree of course but we we try to come up with common positions on most of these issues that that can help boaters so the Green Blue website is a great starting point for for boaters existing and new boaters to, to get that initial information if you join the RYA as a boater then you'll get invited to our club conferences and the club conferences we generally have a presence at as well so we will talk about what whatever the issue of the day is really at the moment we've do, been doing quite a lot on propulsion as people look to decarbonizing but we we cover all of these issues including oils and fuels in each of the talks that we give thanks once again to all my guests for joining me for this episode today i hope you found their insights useful and that some of their views have given you some inspiration and ideas to improve your own environmental impacts when it comes to oil spills and fuel in the water. I know it has me. More information about these issues are easy to find from the links in the podcast introduction. Please do let me know your own thoughts on the areas that we've talked about today, and I really hope that you'll join me again soon for This Marina Life with MDL, the most sustainable marina operator in the UK. The business can invest and have 100% focus on looking after the environment, but the reality is unless boat owners actually join the join the quest, then that's you know the outcome isn't going to be as we would all want. It's not the case that all boat owners are wealthy, so we do need to find solutions that are workable for everybody. 